Welcome to the chat box. I'm David Cruz. On our best behavior today because the boss is on the show. We will meet the new vice president and general manager of NJPBS, Joe Lee. We'll also look at a new documentary about a new worker who became a basketball icon in Israel. But we begin today with the most significant challenge to reproductive rights since Roe v. Wade became law in 1973. The Supreme Court could soon decide to significantly curtail reproductive rights or, or outright overturn Roe v. Wade. Let's get into this now with the co-dean at Rutgers Law. Her focus is on reproductive justice, bioethics, and family health law. Good to welcome back Kimberly Murchison. Dean, good to see you again. You too. Thanks so much for having me. So was I correct in my intro there that it would uh, these decisions could significantly curtail reproductive rights or overturn Roe v. Wade completely? Is that Absolutely. That is stake? exactly where we are. Um, and as you say, right, that is very significant. We have had a few cases in the last few years that have gone up to the court um, where they have reinforced Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which is the 1992 case. Um, and yet here we are once again up at the Supreme Court and the oral argument that we heard uh, the other week suggests that the majority of the justices are prepared to, if not completely overrule Roe, um, to roll it back substantially. So all right, what you're referencing is uh, arguments before the court uh, on this case in Mississippi. It's a challenge to a law there. Can you walk us through what that Mississippi law is trying to do? Yeah, so the law in Mississippi is a 15 week ban. Um, and basically where we have been in the United States since 1992 in Planned Parenthood versus Casey um, is that states cannot ban abortion um, before viability. So 15 weeks is very clearly before viability. So under existing Supreme Court precedent, it is unconstitutional. The only way for that law to stand is for the court to decide that Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey didn't mean what they said. So did you hear that? Or uh, when you listened to the arguments or more importantly, when, when the, the uh, justices comment so, I mean, I think we all who do this kind of work went into the argument expecting that it would be difficult to hear that really the only justices who would make any sort of um, full throated de defense of Casey and Roe um, were Justice Sotomayor, Justice Kagan and Justice Breyer. Um, so the other six justices uh, sort of did exactly what I expected and what lots of other folks, folks expected, which is let's figure out how to poke holes, either to decide, as you know, Justice Thomas would have done many years ago, um, that Roe versus Wade should be overturned because the word abortion doesn't exist um, in the Constitution. That could also be said of privacy, of marriage, of parenthood, right? None of those appear in the, in the Constitution either. Um, or uh, Justice Barrett who had a really um, problematic, I would say, argument that, you know, pregnancy isn't really a burden because you can just give birth to a baby and then put the baby up for adoption. And, you know, there were a lot of things that were said during that argument that really reflected very poorly on how the justices think about women, how the justices think about equality, um, and how the justices think about bodily integrity. So the court is also deliberating on this Texas abortion law also, right? I mean, the yes. arguments there are different. Are they both equally uh, significant in terms of potential impact? Well, Dobbs versus Mississippi is the case that they've already heard on the merits. So the SB8 case, the case from Texas, all of the issues that have been up to the Supreme Court so far are just procedural issues. There hasn't actually been sort of a trial to work out right. the facts and all of those good things. Whereas Dobbs was heard um, in oral argument because all the briefing has been done, um, the, the attorneys on all sides have been able to make their arguments in front of the court, and we should expect a decision from them probably in June. So what happens if Roe v. Wade is overturned? What are, the, what are the practical implications on women who may be seeking access to abortion services? So what happens if Roe gets overturned is that the court basically says there is no longer a federal constitutional right to terminate a pregnancy. That doesn't make abortion illegal in the United States. What it does do is it sends it back to all 
50 states to make their own decisions about whether abortion is going to be legal and accessible in their jurisdictions. Now, there are already many states that have what are called trigger bans, and trigger bans are basically laws that will immediately go into effect if Roe is overturned and will make abortion illegal in those jurisdictions. You have other states that will take this as an opportunity to significantly regulate access to abortion. And then you have other states, New Jersey almost certainly being one of them, that will continue to make abortion um, um, at least legal in the jurisdiction, if not always accessible. Meaning the real possibility of women having to leave their state to go to another state uh, to, to get abortion services. You said um, New Jersey would probably be one that would uphold uh, the right. Um, access to abortion pretty widely available, although not necessarily equally around yes. the state, but available. Uh, right. You said a couple of weeks ago, the court that decides that a right exists can decide that a right doesn't exist any longer. You were talking about the Supreme Court, but it was an example of the way that rights become rights, right? Now mm -hmm. in New Jersey, we've been talking about the Reproductive Freedom Act, which would codify a woman's right to access abortion services. Mm -hmm. What does that mean and, and why is it significant? So there are two things that are really significant about the Reproductive Freedom Act that's been floating around in New Jersey for, for quite some time now and yet has not come to a vote, um, although it's clear that Governor Murphy would sign it if it did get passed. Um, so it does two things. So one is that it codifies the right to abortion um, in New Jersey. So it says this isn't just something that a judge said is useful and important. It is part of our law um, here in New Jersey. So that's one thing that's important. Um, but the second thing is, what's the, what's the point of having a right if you can't actually access it? So the second thing that the Reproductive Freedom Act does that is so important is it expands the kinds of financial resources that people have access to if they want to terminate a pregnancy. Um, so whether it's insurance or Medicaid, um, you know, really making it a right that people can effectuate, right, which, which requires finances. The other thing that has happened um, in New Jersey, and this actually just happened in the past week, um, and this was um, a decision that was made by the State Board of Medical Examiners, but also something that was uh, part of the Reproductive Freedom Act, is expanding the medical providers who can do abortion care. So if you limit it to just physicians, which is completely medically unnecessary. But if you limit it to just physicians, then there are fewer people that folks can go to when they want to have an abortion. But now in New Jersey, advanced practice nurses, certified nurse midwives, physicians assistants, um, people who are completely capable and have sufficient training to perform abortions will be able to do that. And that is also incredibly important for expanding access. All right, 2022 proving to be a critical year. Professor and co-dean at Rutgers Law, Kimberly Marcherson. Good to see you and thanks for coming on with us today and have a great holiday. Absolutely, you do the same. The story of Alcy Perry is one with which you may not be familiar. He is a former Newarker who, after being the final cut by the New York Knicks in the 1970s, went on to accept an offer to play basketball overseas, in this case in Israel. But that's just where this story begins. Alcy Perry went on to become a cultural icon in Israel and then had an equally fantastic fall from grace. His story is captured in a new documentary called Alcy, and it brings director Danny Menken and Alcy Perry to chat box. Gentlemen, good to meet the both of you. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you, Danny. So, Danny, how did you come to know Alcy? Were, were you a fan? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, Alcy Perry is my childhood hero. <laughs> so I feel very lucky that I was the one to tell his story. Also knows that I was chasing after him and his story for 20 years. And it was after we made a film called On the Map about the miracle that Olsen and the Maccabi Tel Aviv basketball team has made in 1977, that Olsen agreed to share all his life story, which I found remarkable. And mainly, I wanted to show a love story between a country, an African-American from New York, New Jersey, and that found in Israel not only his new family, but also he found a second chance. Well, see, I, I want to talk a little about those early years. You're cut by the Knicks. Is that 75, 76, around there? Yes. So you take a job yeah. in Israel uh, to play ball. What's going through your mind then? 
First, my first thought, I'm going to have to pray a lot because all the biblical things that uh, that's happening in Israel. And the second thing, uh, I was told that I would only be there for six games, that Maccabi was playing in the European Cup 25 years, but never made it out of the first round. And only one team can go up, and the team that won the European Cup the year before is in our bracket. So they promised me after six games I would, I would be back home, but we went up. A month and a half, I mean, uh, some months after that, we beat the mighty Cheska team up from Russia, which was the number one basketball team in the world at that time. Uh, and then uh, a month and a half later, we won the European Cup, all in my first year. It was magical. Maccabi Tel Aviv is the name uh, of the team uh, based out of Tel Aviv. But then almost immediately, you became a star with Maccabi. Yes. What was that like? Yes, yes. And, and, and it lasting, and we're talking about 45 years ago, and it lasts until today. There's nowhere in Israel I can go and, and not be treated like a player that's playing now on the team. It's it's unbelievable feeling. Unbelievable. You the say love in the, and, and respect that I get from the people there. You say in the film that you weren't really ready for that kind of attention. No, no, I wasn't. Uh, something I had been searching and, and wanting all my life, but when I got there, I, I wasn't I wasn't quite ready. Uh, but the worst thing was that I got there, and at 33, my knees started to give out, and I panicked because I wasn't ready to 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 retire or or, or quit playing basketball. And that's one of the things that still bothers me right now is that uh, when I look back and think about it, I don't know what I wouldn't have done to add another year or two. And, uh, but when my knees gave out, I went, I was starting to take pain pills for my knees and the pain pill was narcotic. And after six months, the doctor refused to give me any more. And uh, I went to the black market looking for something that I can continue to play. Big mistake in my life, a huge mistake that cost me a lot. Somewhere in that period, you meet a beautiful Israeli model, uh, Tammy, and she becomes the love of your life, no? Yes, uh, we, we. I met her uh, only after two months I was in Israel. We met and uh, I tried to get her phone number, but she said, I'm moving and I'll call you. So I'm waiting and waiting. And about a month and a half after that, she gave me a call. She was living in Yafo. I don't think uh, nobody got to Yafo as fast as I did without waves. <laughs> so I immediately went there and we started to go out there my first year. We were, we were together nine years. Danny, can you describe the fervor for Alsi and Tammy in those days, especially absolutely, as David, the team you know, was winning those championships? Yeah, absolutely, David. You know, you can imagine what the phenomenon it was when Olsi and Tammy went together. She was a top European international model and Olsi was a basketball superstar and they became like the Brejolina, the power couple of the country. So everyone was around them. And Olsi Perry at that time was like our Michael Jordan and Karim Abdul-Jabbar. He's like that until today. And I think the beauty of the story that it crosses religion it crosses color and um, it really shows, you know, some nice, beautiful side of Israel, nice, beautiful side of this gentleman. And mainly it's also a story about redemption. This film begins with your search for your daughter. And you talk yeah. a lot about regrets in your life, uh, about a lot of things and how you had this dead feeling inside of you, despite all, all the success you talked about how you start using narcotics and then suddenly you're busted for distribution and you find yourself in jail for trafficking. And yes. from where you'd been to where you were at that point, did you think that that was the end? Uh, I really did. I, I, I was about to give up, but my family wouldn't let me give up. Uh, they stayed, they supported me, they stayed behind me. My club, even though they were very upset with me, stayed behind me and pushed me. And uh, they, they, it's because of them that I'm back. I came back to Israel. They brought me back, uh, set me up in business, and uh, they really took care of me. There's a scene near the end of the documentary where you appear on the Israeli TV version of This Is Your Life, 
celebrating the famous uh, coach, uh, Shamluk. And, and that seemed like a real turning point for you. It, it, it was. The, the love and, that I felt from, from that visit was unbelievable. You know, meeting my teammates after 10 years, the, the management from Maccabi, all the people around the, the, the basketball world in Israel, I was so warmly welcomed back. It, it, I knew then that uh, I always thought during the bad years that I had that I want to be back in Israel. But after that, it was uh, for sure. This, this is, this is going to be my home. Danny, I was interested to hear that you always saw Alsi's story as a motion picture. It has that kind of an epic uh, sweep to it. Is that still the plan? Absolutely. You know, and you, David, can give me some ideas of who can play uh, <laughs> Olsi Perry. <laughs> you know, if you, Denzel Washington, if you happen to watch the movie, give me a call. I, I like Denzel and, uh, Washington. It has yes, to be taller. You know, that though. was the panic. It started from that, that when Olsi started to search, as you mentioned, David, for his daughter, we started to also shoot as a documentary. And with all those twists and turns, we got a wonderful feature doc, which is now eligible for the Oscars for Best Feature Documentary. And uh, yes, the plan to make it, to turn it into a feature film is still in place. That reunion scene with Alsi, uh, when you meet your daughter, is just beautiful. It made me cry. Danny Menken is the director of Alsi, and Alsi Perry is the inspirational subject. Great to meet you both. Thanks for coming on with us, and good luck with the film. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. It has been a year of great changes for all of us who work in the media landscape, from the pandemic to the social upheaval to an attack on democracy itself. We have seen some crazy times, a perfect time to start a new job. And that's what our next guest did. He's the boss of me and the new VPGM of NJPBS, Joe Lee. Joe, welcome to Chatbox. D. Cruz, how you doing? All right. So you're in Syracuse thinking there's not enough turmoil going on. Let me change jobs. What was that about? <laughs> well, you know, I was in Syracuse for 29 years. And, uh, you know, at some point you, you ask yourself, what's, what's next? You know, what else can I do? Um, and so, you know, I, I thought about it long and hard. Uh, been in radio for quite a long time and thought I'd take on some new challenges uh, working in public television. So, so now you move to the TV side in, in a more formally managerial uh, position. Um, is there a learning curve? Not so much in terms of managing people because you either got it or you don't in that regard. But right. for instance, I mean, doing a debate on the radio is very different than doing one on TV, just the lighting budget alone. Show me the lie in that. You know, show, show me the line that, yeah, and there's a huge learning curve, um, but I'm blessed with a very talented staff, uh, you included. Um, our news division is, is, you know, second to none. People know what they're doing. Uh, and so, you know, and that's not the reason um, that WNAT brought me in, right? So, you know, one of the reasons was uh, to provide a different uh, kind of leadership and uh focus on multimedia capabilities, uh, looking more in uh, to what we might be able to do in community engagement spaces, audio content spaces. So, uh, you know, my, my focus is gonna be on expansion and service, um, but yeah, it's a huge learning curve, uh, but it's a, a lot of fun. Our, our operation has been virtual since March of 2020. Man, March of 2020. And that has its pluses and its minuses. I mean, I miss the newsroom and the camaraderie there, but the, the pandemic has also forced innovation. I mean, this program itself was created in the pandemic and really as a result of the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, you're gonna see a, a lot of media companies finding different ways to do business, getting more efficient with how we produce content. Uh, exploring new technologies and platforms and how we distribute um, and because, you know, our audience's tastes and how they access content changes. So, um, you know, we need to be nimble uh, with, with uh, what our uh, audiences are doing and be right along, you know, with them. So, you know, I started back in 
uh, September. Uh, so I've not had a whole lot of time in the studio either. Yeah. Um, in fact, I've been here for a little minute now, and this is my this is my first time on on Chatbox, and and so now I'm figuring out. I'm trying to figure out if I should be mad about that. Should I come down hard on David Cruz because well, I, you know <laughs> that that co-host slot is uh, looking good. <laughs> so uh, we're already moving in new directions here at at NJPBS. Uh, I'm sure a lot of folks know that we merged with Spotlight, NJ Spotlight, uh, a couple of years ago, and that has just um, changed the way that we present content. You know, mm -hmm. we get as many people watching some of our stuff online as they do on uh, the television. Mm -hmm. What can viewers and listeners look forward to? You teased a couple things, uh, podcasts, et cetera. Are, are, is there anything that you can tell us specifically that you can break here on Chatbox? Well, I mean, you know, we, we want to be thought thoughtful about not saying that we're not now, but really yeah. be thoughtful about what we're covering and the issues we're exploring. Um, one, one thing that we'll announce, and I, I think it's sort of embargoed, but what the heck, um, they're gonna have to fire me. Uh, so we, we've applied for, uh, to, to be a part of Report for America. Uh, we've uh, been granted that. So Report for America is sort of like AmeriCorps where they embed a couple of journalists uh, or a journalist in, in a uh, media outlet uh, to help cover issues that are not covered that much, explore uh, news deserts. So we've actually been allotted two journalists that will uh, start sometime, I think in June, 2022. Uh, one will focus uh, their uh, multimedia um, uh, stuff on uh, social justice issues. The other will look at mental health uh, issues. So, so these are two areas that aren't getting a, a ton of coverage right now. Um, so we're going to do that. Uh, but one of the things I want to do, because our, our news division is so strong, is explore other opportunities to create content beyond news and public affairs. So uh, we are in the process of creating a show that uh, explores people and culture through food. Uh, it's going to be hosted by one of your colleagues, uh, Buki Alegbre. Um, we're going to hopefully launch nice. that in early 2022. Uh, and so, yeah, we want to do, we want to produce content that's reaching out to uh, newer audiences. Uh, we want to find ways to explore the immigrant experience in New Jersey. Um, so we're really getting excited about uh, some non-news uh, and public affairs production. And community engagement, a huge uh, part of your mission uh, when you were upstate, uh, but yeah. also at the heart of why you were brought here yeah i mean we we really need to find ways and it, you know it's a most of my all of my experience and a lot of uh professional media uh, uh folks experience is in a single media market right and so we're we are covering an entire state uh which presents its own challenges and so one of the things that we want to do is really figure out and find a way that we can intimately engage with our audiences and our communities in a way that builds community statewide, if you will. Um, and so the, the questions are, how do we better connect uh, with our supporters and our audiences? How do we instill uh, a sense of ownership of NJPBS? I mean, this is a publicly funded public media organization. This is your public television station, your um, public media organization. So we want folks to um, to connect with us. We want to explore the issues that, that are impacting uh, their lives, uh, and we want to do it in a thoughtful way. All right, Joe Lee, Vice President and General Manager of NJPBS. Good to see you, Jefe. Happy holidays. Same to you. Uh, I, I expect to be back on the next episode. Make you got it, it boss. <laughs> <laughs> That's chat box for this week. Thanks to Joe Lee, Danny Menken, Alcee Perry and Kimberly Mutcherson. You can follow us on Twitter at David Cruz NJ and be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel to get more Chatbox, Business Beat with Rhonda Schaffler and NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. I'm David Cruz for Joe Lee and the entire crew over here. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Major funding for Chatbox with David Cruz is provided by Fuel Merchants Association of New Jersey and Smart Heat NJ.
with the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Promotional support is provided by Insider NJ, a political intelligence network dedicated to New Jersey political news. Insider NJ is committed to giving serious political players an interactive forum for ideas, discussion, and insight. Online at insidernj.com.